All right. I assume a few more will start dropping in, but I will start talking in the meantime. Uh, welcome to those of you who are here to this fourth and final installment of the Climate Dialogues for this season. Um, my name is Michael. I will be moderating this event. Me and the group that are behind it, we all have Climat Studentina in our name. We're super happy to have organized this event, this final one. I'm really excited to see you all here. We know it's getting close to the end of the year and the sun is out today. Uh, so thanks for taking the time and coming to this discussion and the dialogues regarding the climate. If it's the first time you're at one of these events and perhaps you don't know who we are, allow me to fill you in. We, the ones who are organizing this, um, we are part of an organization called Climate Students Lund, or in Swedish, Klimat Studentland. Um, we are a student organization that works towards making the university a university that we feel that we can be part of. And that is one that takes the climate crisis seriously. We work towards that goal in a lot of different ways. Uh, we're constant uh, nuisance with, to the school administration and have a lot of contact with them. We host events, we write reports for the school or articles for different papers. We also try to do a lot of uh, climate related um, discussions and information sharing, such as this. We try the best we can to make the university live up to the Paris Agreement. And so we do that in a myriad of ways. And we're always looking for members. So regardless of your background or your expertise, uh, we're firm believers in diversity, both genetically and academically. And we believe that all people are, are equally needed in order to make that transition that we need. So if you want to join, feel free to write to me or any of the other ones with Tomas to them in their name. And we will show you uh, Slack groups and Facebook pages and stuff that we have. And get you sorted and get you rolling in, in our organization. So what are the climate dialogues? It's basically an event that's recurring. This is the fourth time uh, where we host two thinkers, researchers or professors uh, who work with climate in, in different ways, usually in vastly different aspects of sustainability. Uh, and then we have this dialogue that we hope can facilitate some kind of trans and interdisciplinary discussion. And we also hope that whatever your background is, you will be inspired and take something with you and learn that you can do something for the climate in whatever field you are in. So today you'll be hearing uh, two 20 minute presentations from two distinct professors, and there'll be a short break. And then we will have a discussion in the end where everyone, including our speakers, are free to ask questions and comment on each other's answers. If you want to ask a question, um, please use the raise hand function. You can also write it to me or in the general chat, uh, and then we will read the question for you. You can also write it in Swedish if you prefer, and uh, I will do my best to translate. Right. Um, I mentioned it's being recorded, so for those of you who dropped in late, uh, you can find it on YouTube afterwards. And if you don't want to be part of the recording, change your name to anonymous and just um, don't use your camera. So without further ado, the first of today's prominent speakers is Professor Lars Nilsson, who is a professor at the Department of Technology and Society. He teaches on climate science and politics and also teaches energy and climate policy. He has over 25 years of experience in this field and is currently coordinating uh, and he's the lead author, I think, if I got it correctly, a chapter 11 on industry in the IPCC sixth assessment report, which is incredible. And today he will present his recent research that looks at different aspects of policy strategies and governance. We'll talk especially for how low carbon transitions in the basic materials, um, such as like steel, chemicals, and cement, and they can change to low carbon. So for those of you who are here, if you have any questions about how we can effectively transition the industry to low carbon, what instruments of change we have as a society, then you, my friend, you've come to the right place. Please give a warm digital applause for our first speaker of the evening, the incredibly bright Dr. Lars Nielsen. <laughs> Thank you. That's uh, flattering. Uh, let's see here. Um, if I can get this started. Yes, yeah, so I'm a professor in the uh, engineering faculty and um, have been uh, taken an interest in the uh, industry for uh, five, 10 years now. 
And the background is a bit like this. So in Sweden, we are fortunate to have a basically fossil free energy system in terms of electricity and, and heat for our buildings. Um, there's a lot of attention now to the transport sector and we're probably looking at a uh, quick electrification of the transport sector. And of course, a host of other measures are also needed. Uh, so there are several background reasons to why I got involved with, with heavy industry. But anyway, I have been so for quite a while and also involved in this uh, chapter in the upcoming, the next IPCC report, which should come out in a year from now. Uh, it's quite a long process to get it done and it has been delayed by COVID. But I will try to give you an overview of, of sort of what, what, what is industry and what kind of emissions do we have. And uh, uh, first point here is perhaps that uh, a big, it's a big difference now. We've been, uh, until the Paris Agreement, we were contemplating 20, 30, 40, maybe 50% emission reductions. But with the two and a one and a half degree target, we, we now see that everything has to go to zero as fast as possible. And uh, so does uh, heavy industry. And this slide shows you how industrial emissions have increased rapidly since around the year 2000. And much of that is the red part, Eastern Asia. A lot of that is China. China has about half of the world's production of cement, half of the world's production of steel and maybe beside the point here but also half of the world's pig pigs which is interesting anyway they have been growing faster than other sectors um, the share of global emissions will probably continue to increase to grow as we now see possibilities for emission reductions in the energy and transport sectors and we're gonna look into some of the materials, the basic materials, but it's interesting to note that plastics has been the fastest growing uh, material uh, in terms of uh, production. So when I talk about industry, I make a difference between like sort of manufacturing industry, like Volvo or Electrolux, that sort of assemble stuff. Uh, they are not that big, they don't, they are, fairly easy to decarbonize. Um, the ones uh, that I focus more on is the basic materials industry. It's the chemical industry, which has a lot of petrochemicals and plastics production. It's the iron and steel industry. It's the cement industry. So those are, if you look at the red dots, those are the biggest emitters. And it might look strange that Cement doesn't have high final energy demand, but they have high emissions, but that has to do with what's called process emissions. So in cement, you take calcium carbonate and you heat it up so that you get calcium oxide and carbon dioxide. So the, the carbon is in the calcium carbonate. And uh, also in iron and steel, you use coal to get a reducing atmosphere to rip the oxygen away from, from the iron ore where you have ferrous oxides and you take the oxygen away. <clears throat> Petrochemicals, you use a lot of uh, fossil fuel and feed and in stock, feedstock and fuel uh, to produce, uh, for example, the various types of plastics we're all, all using today. Uh, so I will talk a little bit about those, not so much about cement because, because of the <clears throat> carbon coming with the feedstock, the limestone, the main option for the cement industry and the primary production is actually to use carbon capture and storage technologies and, uh, and store the carbon dioxide geologically. But some general observations about industry and transitioning, transitioning the industrial sector. We noted this sort of insight that the Paris Agreement really means zero and the industry cannot wait to be the last sector to decarbonize. And when looking at this problem, looking at the materials, the products, the value chain, global value chains, it clear, it's clear that you know, uh, we cannot see this transition as a pollution problem. It goes much deeper into reorganizing production 
uh, there will be new sectoral couplings. So as you see here, cheap renewable electricity is one key. Um, we're going to see electrification is one option, which means that we have new couplings between industry and the industrial sector. Perhaps with the use of hydrogen, there will be new couplings between different industries. As we need to move away from using fossil carbon, we need to take renewable carbon or carbon from the air, uh, new business models, etc. Uh, I will show you that this uh, makes some of the materials more expensive, but the, it's not a big problem if you think about the cost impact on final products. So even if cement becomes 50, 100% more ex expensive, steel becomes more expensive, the effect on the cost of a car or a building is just one or 2%. So it's, it's affordable in that sense. Uh, it means new infrastructure for renewable electricity and for hydrogen and for carbon capture and use, carbon capture and storage. Um, it, it is getting, these materials are gaining increasing interests from, from example, car makers and construction companies. So last year, last week, I heard the chief executive of Polestar, electric car and hybrid car maker, uh, saying that they have this electric car that if you drive it using clean electricity, it has zero emissions, but the materials themselves in the car, they have embodied emissions of about 26 tons of carbon dioxide. And their ambition is to reduce that to zero emissions by 2030 by using green materials. Um, and so in addition to the Paris Agreement and the need to get to zero emission, another thing that has really changed in the past 10 years is the cost of solar and wind technologies. This shows you the cost of power generation. We don't need to go into the details, but we can note that the cost of solar and the cost of wind has drama dropped dramatically in the past 10 years which makes electrification a viable option and which raises a lot of issues of where do we locate industries in the future? Should they be in renewable rich regions like Northern Scandinavia or Australia? Can we think about new global value chains for importing, exporting energy intensive materials and chemicals rather than importing, exporting coal, oil and gas? So uh, this is uh, changing a lot of things, this, this rapid decrease in costs. <clears throat> I don't know, most people don't think much about materials, but we use them all the time. We use metals, we have minerals that we use. Some of that we convert into cement and concrete. Organic materials and compounds like plastics, nitrogen fertilizer, which is incredibly important for agriculture. And if we look at this primary, you know, the, the primary conversion step is the energy intensive step where a lot of fossil fuel emissions uh, occur. And if we want to look at the option in that step, it's basically three things we can do. We can do carbon capture and storage. We can do bio-based feedstock and fuels, but we know biomass is a limited resource. And we can do electricity and hydrogen, electrify and use hydrogen. And as I noted initially, uh, it makes these materials more expensive, uh, but it's not catastrophically more expensive. We can absorb that cost, but it, it's a bit different from thinking about sustainable cities or sustainable mobility, where we have different co-benefits of less accidents, less air pollution, uh, less noise and stuff going on at the same time. Uh, potentially, we did a calculation that if you took uh, European energy intensive industry and electrified it, we would need much, much more electricity than we use today, more than doubling the industrial electricity use and increasing European electricity use by 50%. So it's quite a lot of electricity. And most of it is in chemicals. And you can imagine that today we use about 14% of the oil in the world is used to produce chemicals. And if we replace that with electricity and hydrogen, it's a lot of energy. So we have to be smarter. It's not only about converting this primary production, it's also that we need to think about how we can use less, how we can recycle more, 
So we avoid those primary uh, production conversion steps that are so energy intensive. Um, further reflecting on materials, uh, plastics in Europe, we're using about 100 kilograms per capita. Uh, you can question, do we need all that plastics? 40% uh, of it is in packaging, very short cycle or lifetime, very low recycling. Uh, for many reasons, it's difficult uh, to recycle in a good way. Uh, paper, about 150 kilograms, 40% packaging, 40% printing paper. Printing paper is going down, packaging is going up due to uh, E-Trade. Uh, relatively high recycling for paper. We've had that material for hundreds of years and we've had, uh, well, different types of papers for thousands of years. So we always took care of the pipe paper fibers. Uh, steel, 300 kilograms per year per capita, much of it in construction, but also cars. For steel, it's also interesting to think or relevant to think about how much we have in stock, which is 12 tons per capita in Europe in stock. Uh, because it's a long-lived material, uh, relatively high levels of recycling, very different from plastics and paper when you recycle. So paper is a fiber, plastics is a polymer, and when you recycle it degrades, right? So you have to keep putting in new virgin material to make the, the cycle work. But with, with steel or iron, which is basically, it's an element, it's an atom, so uh, in, in theory, you can recycle it forever. And there is that at the end of this century, the world will not need to produce any new virgin iron, but that we can have an economy that is using enti entirely based on steel scrap, actually. Um, an interesting thought. So for Transitioning industry, we have to look across the whole board, demand reduction or at least moderate demand in terms of demand growth. Um, we need to pay more attention to material sufficiency. So using less steel and cement for providing the same services, uh, of, you know, have longer product lifetimes, no planned obsolescence of, of products, uh, more circular material flows with more recycling, um, energy efficiency is of course important because if we are energy efficient, we need to build less wind power and less solar. Electrification and hydrogen, uh, another option for primary production. And then at the end, when we have no other solutions, carbon capture and use, and at the very end, carbon capture and storage, which is probably be necessary for, for cement factories. And, uh, you know, along this, I, I think it's worth pointing out that we pay far too little attention to demand and materials efficiency. And I'm not saying that we should regulate the number of square meters we get to live on, but we need to keep in mind that the way we plan and build our cities and infrastructure does have a big impact on the demand for these materials. We need to keep that in mind. Um, I won't go into too much detail on this. Maybe we can discuss it later in the questions session, but uh, just to note that these different subsectors in industry, they also have very different structures and characteristics, which means that you cannot uh, have one policy or one solution. You have to get into the sectors and understand their value chains. And they're also in different stages of thinking about the future. So for plastics, I'm saying there's no vision in the petrochemical industry for how they will become fossil free. The opposite is happening now. They're investing heavily in new chemical production clusters based on fossil fuel and, and feedstocks. Uh, paper industry is relatively easy to decarbonize. Uh, the interesting thing about the pulp and paper industry is that in the future, we might want to have that uh, bio-based, the, the biogenic carbon. We might want to use that to produce chemicals instead of getting the carbon from fossil fuels. Steel is the sector where I think uh, has moved the fastest, where, where visions are forming. 
of a future which is uh, emissions free and probably increasingly fossil free by going to hydrogen reduction. And I will uh, give examples of that. So this is um, a clip from uh, Swedish Dagens Industri uh, business newspaper where in uh, exactly five years ago they published this article saying this is the this is the way that the steel industry will become fossil free for the first time announcing the ambition to become fossil free and mentioning the option of hydrogen and i could not have you know dreamt a few years before that uh, that this this could happen because the steel industry was really dragging its feet but then they make this mental shift a strategic reorientation of of how they look at the future and they decide to you know we want to be part of the solution not part of the problem we know that steel is needed to build wind turbines etc in infrastructure and only uh, only uh, last year then they completed this pilot plan uh, which uh, pilot plant in the steel industry, that's one ton of iron per hour. So it's, it's still pretty big. Uh, and uh, this year, 2021, they are now running trials with using hydrogen to reduce the iron oxide. So, and a lot of other steel companies in Europe has followed suit and, and tried to do the same. But it's not only about these new things, it's also thinking about the things will, that must, must disappear. Uh, and, and maybe this can link to Eric's talk later. I'd like to put yourself in the future. This is a museum from the year 2053. I don't know if any of you uh, visited this Carbon Ruins Museum, which was in the Political Science Building, Eden. Uh, with different objects and a timeline of what happened from 2015 with the Paris Agreement and 2016 when hybrid company is formed and things happening all along the way here up until 2045 when Sweden reaches net zero emissions and become a fossil free welfare state. Uh, and it's not only about getting those new things, it's also about getting rid of the old stuff like this example from 2027 that the oil industry crashed, Norwegian gas company divests from fossil fuels, some go bankrupt, some are taken over, some oil companies are merging uh, to survive in a shrinking market for, for fossil fuels. Uh, so that's also worth thinking about. And it's not only about those, how should I say, big companies and technical solutions, uh, my favorite object in this uh, exhibition was the frequent flyer bonus card. Um, and it's, you know, it's quite interesting to think that in the beginning of the 20 of this century, people had those bonus cards, which became the hallmark of success. And the more you traveled, the nobler you got with special privileges and, and free champagne and stuff. But this is what people uh, were striving for. So it's also about sociocultural norms, probably. And uh, I don't know what's going to happen with a frequent flyer bonus card in reality. But it's it's one way of thinking thinking about the future, which I I think is is quite good for expanding the mind. Uh, I also added this slide. I won't go into it in detail, but. Um, I think you, Philip, you talked, you were in the School of Economics, right? And uh, uh, this was just to show you, if you're interested, you can dig deeper into this, but there are different ways of looking at uh, climate policy and, and what should be done. And uh, on one side, you could say there are neoclassical economics that consider the climate change as a, a market failure problem and all we need is a carbon price. And then myself, I'm more on the sustainability transition perspective that this is systemic changes that need to be done, broad changes, a carbon price is not, a, not all. We need broad sequential strategies to change the whole system, not only introduce a carbon price. And 
So this is things that are, we are working on right now. Basically, we've tried to develop a framework for thinking uh, about industrial transition and industrial policy. Uh, first of all, you need a direction, right? And there has been a development of this different industrial roadmaps and visions and strategies for, for going to zero emissions. Uh, that's important because uh, like uh, someone said, if you have to be careful if you don't know where you're going because you might not get there. Um, knowledge creation and innovation is always important and it's very common that governments engage in supporting research, development and innovation. Now we have to direct that towards also heavy industry. What's often forget, forgotten is the need to create and reshape markets. There are no free markets. Uh, markets are always shaped by, by politics and by inertia and history. And one important experience from the renewable energy revolution is the importance of uh, creating green market demand pools. So we need to create market demand and willingness to pay for green materials. We also need to build capacity. I often make the comparison, if you think about the energy and transport sector, we have government ministries, we have government agencies, we have whole university departments called energy sciences or transport, department of transport. We have nothing like that when it comes to industry or, or plastics. There's no plastics agency that has competence and expertise on plastic and petrochemicals and how we can transform that sector. And then since these guys are operating in competition on international markets, we also need to pay more attention to international coherence uh, to avoid that industry moves to places where there are no demands on, on reducing emissions. A lot of things going on in that area right now in Europe. We have a discussion of changing the European trading scheme. There are discussions of introducing so-called carbon border adjustment mechanisms, which is to put sort of a tariff or a tax at the European border on steel and cement that has high emissions in relation to the emissions. And then to sort of hand the floor over to Eric maybe here is to think about the phase outs and socioeconomic implications of, of these transitions. And it's very clear, you know, if you close coal mines, uh, people, miners lose their jobs, etc. We might have similar effects if we close some industries, uh, relocate the industries. So thinking about labor market and welfare policies for retraining and, and reinvesting to create new jobs in those areas is, is also important. Uh, so thank you for listening. Much of this is based on work also contributed by, by others in this uh, project we had that finished in November last year. But I think that was my last slide.